The teaching that you're about to hear this morning is part of our year-long campaign that we are calling the Year of Biblical Literacy. You can find out more over on our website at midtownbiblicalliteracy.com. And there you can find reading plans, resources, podcast episodes, all in an effort to help us raise our understanding of the Bible. So with that in mind, enjoy this teaching. Our scripture today is Proverbs 16, 1 through 3. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, I'm Michelle, your communications director. I'm spending the next couple of Sundays at both our downtown and Lexington churches to ask people about wisdom. Let's hear what they have to say. If you find yourself in a situation that you can't handle, who are you talking to and why? You know, when I'm in a tough situation or a moment where I just don't know if I can handle it or don't know what to do, I'm looking for I'm looking for somebody in my life who I trust, somebody who maybe has had that experience or a similar experience. My parents, my wife, uh, my pastoral leadership is what I'm supposed to say probably. Aside from the Bible, who do you turn to for advice? My wife. My husband. So for me, if I needed somebody to go talk to, I would naturally, I would call my dad. I always have my dad on speed dial, no matter what happens, I'm still 24. And he's like my first person on call, whether it's like needed to check the tire pressure or what is going on. Um, he's the person that just kind of is like my calmness. Like if there's stuff at school, I usually go to my mom because she's usually just like knows what to do whenever there's drama at school. Who is the wisest person you know, and why do you view them that way? Um, ooh, that'd probably have to be one of my former small group leaders in high school. His name is Cliff. The things he would tell us uh, apply now and will probably apply to me forever. Let me think about things in a really cool way that I hadn't before, so. Honestly, like when I think of wisdom, I kind of think of like experience, and I'd say probably an old life group leader. You want to give that life group leader a shout out? Yeah, David Clayton and Spencer Kelm. Probably go to my wife or my brother, maybe some folks in my life group for advice. Why do you go to them? Why are they the people you choose? Uh, I've surrounded my life with folks that I trust and I feel like they have similar life values and we wanted to give me a, areas where I have blind spots or you know other problems. Do you think that guy was a Clemson fan? It's hard to say. Anyway, welcome. Uh, my name is Jake. I'm one of your pastors here, and we are on week two of our wisdom series where we are unpacking what it means to live the good life that God has laid out for us. So last week, we talked about the fear of the Lord, and today we are getting more into the nitty gritty, getting very practical here. So this morning, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 16. would invite you to turn there. Proverbs chapter 16. And as you're turning there, I have a story I want to share with you real quick as you're turning there in your Bible. So flashback, this is about 13 years ago, and there was a guy, he was about 24 years old, he was in full-time college ministry, and he was traveling that day to go to a Christian conference, and he didn't want to drive on his own, so he drove with some college students that he worked with uh, to this conference. He also couldn't tell you why, but he decided that day he wanted to wear his one very cool article of clothing, which was a black leather jacket. Yes, black, of course. And so after eight hours or so in the car, he arrives with his college friends at this conference in Greensboro, North Carolina. He gets in this long line to register for the conference, and the line moves very slowly. It's about 10 or 15 people in the front of the line would get to the front of the line, and then they would go to the registration tables, and then there would be a staff person working the conference that would stop the line, and then we'd wait another five minutes or so, and then that staff person would let another 10 to 15 people sign up to the registration table. So this happens for a bit, and the guy is at the front of the line. He's getting pretty close. There's maybe two people ahead of him, and he's about to go to the registration tables, but then the staff person stops them right there to where he's at the very front of the line. He's stopped by this female staff person overseeing the line, and that guy thought about this woman in that moment. Ooh, she's cute. And then that woman thought about that guy in that moment. Ooh, he's cute. And he's this leather jacket. Tell me more. 
And that was the first time this guy met the woman that he would later date and marry and have four kids with. Uh, This woman so happened to also be in full-time ministry, and prior to going into ministry, she went to a young, small church called Midtown Fellowship in Columbia, South Carolina. And over their years of dating and marriage, they would pop in on random Sundays whenever they were in town to go to this church. And later, they end up deciding to leave ministry in Kentucky to be a part of this church. If you haven't figured that out, uh, that story is about me and my wife and how we met. And it's wild to think of all of the decisions that seemed insignificant in the moment. It actually led to me meeting Lucy. But it does make me think from time to time questions like, what happened if I chose not to ride with my college friends on that day? Or what happened if we arrived maybe five minutes later? Would I have had that interaction with her at the front of the line? What would happen had I not worn my cool leather jacket? You know, these are questions. You know, every time I bring up that story, my wife is always quick to say, well, it was a fake leather jacket. And I was like, no, it still looked like a leather jacket, though. And she said, well, you got that at Forever 21. And I said, there's a guy section at Forever 21. And so we go back and forth, and then I'm like, I don't know why you're dunking on me. Like, it worked, okay? So, like, this is on you. But to think, my life could have been completely different. At the very least, I would not have met Lucy the way I did. At most, I might not be here right now in Columbia teaching to you guys, and there might not be four tiny humans who exist in the world. Now, Think about your life. I I did some research. According to Harvard, you make about 35,000 decisions in a single day. You and I have 35,000 decisions we make each day. Most of the time, we don't even think about it. It's just kind of we're on autopilot, but 35,000 decisions. And we have no guarantees on how any will turn out. We don't know which ones will end up mattering very little or whether or not it could change the whole trajectory of our lives. And when you think about it that way, that's a lot that you have riding on us each and every day. Now, what if I were to tell you that there was a way to set yourself up for greater success than failure when it comes to making everyday decisions? Is that something you would be interested in? Okay, five of you are very interested in this. That's great. For you five, I've got a great sermon for you. That's what we're talking about today. How do we become wise people who make wise decisions? And to be fair, the decisions I have in mind are less wardrobe related and far more substantial. If your takeaway from the sermon is I should go out and buy a leather jacket, I think we've missed, we've missed the connection here. We've missed communication. Uh, so with that in mind, Proverbs chapter 16, starting in verse 1, says this, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So this is what's known in scripture as parallelism. It's this Hebrew poetry trick where each line of the passage sounds similar to the last one, but not exactly. There's similarities and dissimilarities. So we have Uh, essentially three lines of verses that are all talking about the same thing, more or less saying the same thing, but parallelism is that there are key differences. And when you spotlight what those key similarities and differences are, that's when the meaning really comes out of the text. So I'll give you a really silly example. Here's a poem I wrote this week using the parallelism trick. And as as I say each line by line, I want you to see if you can notice the similarities and dissimilarities to hear what I'm saying, okay? Here's here's my poem. I am not a poet, but here's my poem. Line one, I love pizza. Sauce, bread, and cheese go great together. Thank you for existing, Domino's. You see, that's each line is similar, but it's different, and your job is to sit and meditate with that poem to draw out all of the implications of that. Now, Think about that, Proverbs 16. Look at that again. If you have a Bible, look at the text. Look at how three of those verses, they're all saying the same thing, similar but dissimilar. What do you notice? Because that's where the insight will come out. I'll give you a couple things that I noticed. So when you look at those three verses, you see two two forces at work in each of those three lines. There's first, there's our agency. 
So there's this repetition of our plans, our work. These In each verse, there's a part that we have to play. What we do matters in our decision-making. And then we see the second agent at work, namely the Lord. We see in all three verses, the Lord is repeated. So we have these two foundational concepts when it comes to decision-making, is that we have a part to play, we have agency in our decisions, and who is behind it all? The Lord. God is behind it. And that matters, because if you don't hold those two principles together in balance when it comes to decision-making, you will veer off to one side or the other when it comes to making decisions. Error, Error number one, if I don't have those two things in mind, that what I do matters and God is in control, then it can easily lead to overthinking. So I have a decision to make, but I'm so caught up in the details and the weightiness of the decision that you're either way too slow to act or you don't act at all. You're stuck in decision paralysis, hoping the magical solution will just fall into place. So you do nothing, waiting for the moment to arrive, and the moment never arrives. And this can easily happen when you believe you don't have any real agency in your choices. You're just a victim to your circumstances. You're left overthinking. But then there's the other side of it, where rather than overthinking, we swing so far the other way in our decision-making, and it leads to impulsivity. Impulsivity says, I have a decision to make, and I'm so caught up in the moment that I'm relying too much on what my gut thinks, that I don't have the ability to just cool down and step back and deliberate the decision. I just act in the moment, and I hope for the best, but this too is missing out because you're behaving as though God is not in control, and it's all on you in the moment to figure out your life right here, right now. That's another extreme. For what it's worth, I had my mentor uh, back when I was doing college ministry would tell me, don't ever make a decision in a valley. And and man, that just stuck with me of whenever I'm feeling a certain way or circumstantially, I'm just feeling like low. Don't make a decision in a valley. Don't make this big life-altering decision because you're down here. And he would always encourage me, just wait, step back, wait for the decision to clear up and resolve itself. Wait till you're out of the valley and then rightly assess what to do with this area, with this decision. So those are two extremes of what happens when we don't consider those two ideas, that you have agency and God is in control. So with that, how do I actually make wise decisions? Well, the key is found in verse three. It says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So there it is. How do you make wise decisions? You commit your work to the Lord. So that poses the question, what does that mean? What does it mean to commit your work to the Lord? I'm so glad you asked this question. So what we have to do is as faithful Bible readers, we have to do our work. We have to read through the rest of the book of Proverbs and the rest of the scope of scripture to see what does it look like to be a person who commits their work to the Lord? Well, in Proverbs, we're given a few clues on what that means, how that looks. I'll give you clue number one. When it comes to making wise decisions, this is in Proverbs 4, 20 and 22. It says, my son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. So pause for a second. This is King Solomon, and he is speaking to his son. But zooming out, there's something more going on. God is speaking to Solomon, speaking through Solomon, rather, to God's people. So there's more going on than just Solomon speaking to his son. It's God speaking through Solomon to speak to God's people. To use a theological word, this is what's called verbal plenary inspiration, if you will. Will you? Good, I'm glad. Where this is God, he speaks through the human authors to communicate truth. So in this verse, is it Solomon speaking to his son or is it God speaking to his people? And the answer is yes. God is speaking through Solomon saying, if you want to be a wise person, listen to my words. This is what I'm saying to you. Meditate on this. And that gives us the first category. If you want to make wise decisions, commit yourself to God's word. Commit yourself to God's word. And scripture invites us. It invites us to see reality for what it really is, that God is at the center of it all, that God invites us into relationship with him, and helps us to see how to live. So if I want to be wise, 
I need to regularly be in God's word. To put it another way, if I want to know what God wants for my life, I need to know what he's already said in scripture. And the book of Proverbs and the entire scope of scripture is filled with all this wisdom available right in front of you when it comes to relationships and family and marriage and finances and work and near anything else you can think of. Wisdom is available and it's here for the taking so that you're not left on your own to figure it out. What a gift we have that we have God's word available to us. Did you know for like the first 15, 1600 years of Christianity, most people had no access to a Bible? And what a privilege you and I have that we live in a time and a place where we have all of this right in front of us. So quick, shameless plug for this whole year. We are really pushing for this year of biblical literacy. We're putting resources in front of you to help you to understand how to study the Bible on your own, to commit yourself to God's word. So check that out. All those resources are on our website. So that's the first one, category number one, how we make wise decisions. Here's the second clue that we see in Proverbs, Proverbs 15, 29. It says, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. So God hears us. He wants us to talk to him in prayer. There's actually a similar verse found in the New Testament, one of my favorite, James 1.5. Kid Town kids have this song like locked and loaded. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Ask God, ask God. There you go. If you don't know what that means, sign up for Kid Town and you'll know what that means. Who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. So that leads us to category number two, how we make wise decisions Commit yourself to prayer. So James 1.5, I just want to camp on that for a moment. I love that verse so much. I pray that verse a lot in my life. That is a promise God is making to us. Do you want wisdom on something? Ask. God will hear you. God will answer you. I find myself doing that a ton. God, I don't know what to do with parenting. Will you help me? God, I don't know how to handle this care situation. Will you help me? God, help me with all of this. And what I find is God answers, whether that's bringing a verse to mind or a friend from church recommending a book or a podcast or someone telling me what's worked for them. I mean, can we just reflect for a moment how incredible that is? The God of the universe, he's not some distant cosmic force out there who has left you to stumble in the dark to figure out life on your own. Rather, God loves you. God guides you. God wants to give you wisdom. If you just stop and ask him in prayer. I think about how uh, some of you know this, but I recently finished up some post-grad work in biblical studies. And one of my favorite things was to be able to talk to professors. These were experts in their field on the Bible about literally anything that would come to mind regarding the Bible. I would ask them questions, and they were just right there available to give me answers just on the spot, these experts in their field. They, like, they're the expert. My job is to listen to what they have to say. They know what to do. So similarly, when it comes to prayer, it's like God has all the wisdom. He is the expert in all things. Why not just ask him? So this means if I want to be a wise person, I need to be in prayer regularly. Not just when I have a wise decision to make, but regularly getting away from distractions and inputs and focusing my mind on him and his word. And I think this can be really difficult now more than ever, because if I'm constantly filling my mind with other inputs like social media or music or TV or whatever, then I'm actually unable to quiet my mind and to be still and to focus on God and pray to him. I think that's so crucial. If you don't regularly spend time in prayer talking to him, you will inevitably become the victim of your own circumstances, listening to your own inner monologue rather than God's. Again, if I could just give a shameless plug, we have tons of resources on our website on how to pray. Just go over to our website. We have that for you. So that's the second way we commit our work to the Lord and make wise decisions. The third and final clue, I'll just read these verses in Proverbs and you figure out where I'm going with this one. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 19, 20, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Proverbs 11, 14, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. So number three, 
we commit ourselves to God's people. Commit ourselves to God's people. Look back at Proverbs eleven fourteen. I love that last bit. In an abundance of counselors, there is safety. In other words, how do you not blow up your life and ruin it? By having an abundance of counselors, by having people who love you, people who love Jesus, people who want you to grow in your love for Jesus and are stepped back and removed enough from the situation enough to tell you what you need to hear even when you don't want to hear it. Now, how do I find those counselors? Well, the Bible is pretty clear that the local church is the primary place to do that, to get an abundance of wise counselors to help you live into wisdom. Which shameless plug here, all right, I'm giving a lot of shameless plugs, but third and final plug, if you are not involved in a life group, my hope and prayer is that you would take the next step in your walk with Jesus and join a life group to surround yourself with others, to help you live into this godly wisdom, to have people who say, I love Jesus and I love you and I want Jesus for you. And so let's do this together. Let's live into this life of wisdom. Let's help one another to get around folks and bring up things you're genuinely trying to figure out in life. Like, how am I supposed to handle this situation? What am I supposed to do with this? For college students, how should I think about my major? How should I think about my career path? Who should I date? Ask your life group. Ask a pastor. We'd we'd love to give you input on that. For parents, questions like, how should I raise my kids? When should I give my kids a phone? Ask your life group. Some of you have kids and they can be a real struggle and you're thinking, I don't know how to handle this. What a perfect opportunity to bring that to your life group and say, hey, here's what's going on in my life. Do y'all have any insight? Do y'all have any help on this? And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that's hard to do because everyone in my life group is the same age and in season of life as me, okay, take the initiative, find other folks in our church and ask for their advice on stuff. Or if you don't know who those people would be, ask a pastor, we'd love to point you to other people in our church that have lots of wisdom in whatever whatever area you are thinking through. I remember asking a friend of mine a while back in our church when it comes to family devotional stuff. It was just getting kind of stale and boring, but we just kept doing it because it's like, well, you know, we have to do this, but I could use some help. What's been working for y'all? And I remember this, one of the guys said, here's what we've been working through. So I bought that on Amazon the next day and we've been working through it and my kids have loved it. And I would have never arrived to that conclusion had I not just spoken up and asked people who love me and want Jesus for me and want Jesus for my family. So to recap, how do we make wise decisions? How do we commit our work to the Lord? It's those three things. Commit yourself to God's word and to prayer and to God's people. They're all on the same team to help, me, to help guide us towards wise decision-making. But this also comes with a warning. So if you look at Proverbs 16.2 one last time, it has a warning right in the middle of the passage that I think we would do well to listen to. Proverbs 16.2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So this passage warns and reminds us that left on our own, we think we will make the good decision when in reality, it may not actually be the case. So how do you determine whether your decisions are good or not? All depends on whether you're leaning into those three resources that God has for us, his word, prayer, and his people. If you have green lights across all three, it's like, okay, then you can faithfully make that decision. You can go accordingly. So as I have a decision to make, do I have verses that steer me in one direction or another? Category number one. Category number two, am I praying about this topic? Am I regularly bringing it before God? Do I feel like God is leaning me one way or another? And just so that's not just caught up in the realm of subjectivity, category three Have I brought this up to wise people who love Jesus and who love me? What do they have to say? Because all three of these are meant to work together. They're all on the same team. So if I have a decision and all three are on the same team, green lights all around, then you can make your decision and walk in confidence. And on the flip side, if you're making a decision and not all three are on the same team, you don't have green lights across all three, I think you should pause. I think at the very least, it should give you some cause for concern to see if you're living sinfully or unwisely. So if I may say the blunt thing about this topic, may I? May I? Okay, thank you. When making decisions, I think we would do well to heed that warning. 
to not do what is pure in our own eyes. And to get really practical, that means some of you need to stop putting God's name on your foolishness. By that I mean, what I've noticed is that in church circles, people will make really bad, really foolish decisions and use the language of, I feel God is leading me or us to blank. Or I've been praying about blank for a while and I have a piece about it, so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. In fact, I see this happen most often with people in full-time ministry. I see this happen with pastors a lot. Where I see pastors do this using the language of, God called me to this, so I'm leaving this church. And they shock everyone in the church by saying, well, I've been praying about this for a while and I'm getting a new job here. And it's like, uh, okay, maybe you did, or maybe you just wanted to get more money and you wanted a job promotion. If so, say that. Okay, I remember there was one very well-known pastor who was under church discipline, wasn't allowed to teach from stage for a while. And as the elders were trying to figure that out, the guy said, oh, actually, God called me to plant a new church, so I'm going to go now. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not saying God did it, but I'm just saying that's really suspicious, the timing of all of that. But I noticed this isn't just with pastors. People in church do this a lot, too. And my fear is when you use hyper-spiritual language like that, it's as if you're saying, yeah, I prayed about it, I have a piece about it, so don't ask me about it. Don't ask me questions on it. The decision has been made. And when that happens, what often happens is you're really saying, I just want to do what I want to do, and I just want you to agree with me, so please don't push back. So please hear me, if that's you, please stop over-spiritualizing something you just really want to do. Please stop lying about God to make yourself feel better. Please take his name out of your mouth. Please stop making decisions on your own and baptizing them in pseudo-spiritual lingo so that no one pushes back on you and you feel better about yourself because you look super spiritual. Because when you do that, that could very well be why your relationship is the mess that it is because you're not really getting input from God's word and prayer and his people. You're just doing what's pure in, his, in your own eyes. That's likely why your life is how it is, because people who genuinely love you are trying to tell you otherwise, but you don't want to hear it when in reality, you are the common denominator behind most of, if not all of your problems. That's likely why you church hop every 10 years and you're about to leave this one. You've over-spiritualized your preferences to the point where no one can push back or speak to you. And when you over-spiritualize things, my concern is I genuinely worry you are creating this terrible trajectory for your soul if you never truly pause and step back and listen to what God and others might be trying to say to you in your decision-making process. You're just doing what's pure in your own eyes without stopping to consider, maybe I'm off on this. Maybe I need some outside input. So I'm begging you, as your pastor who loves you and wants Jesus for you, please stop putting God's name on something he didn't really say. And if that's you, please run to God, the source of all grace and love and forgiveness and wisdom. He wants to restore you and help you and give you guidance, true guidance on life. If you will stop and listen and commit yourself to him and prayer, and his people. All right, soapbox is over. Y'all are still here. That's great. This is all to say, I want us to be a church where healthy, wise decision-making is normal and natural. We allow each other to speak into each other's lives because we're all in this together. We're all trying to go in the same direction together. We're all trying to walk closer and closer with Jesus. Now, are there instances of churches manipulating and abusing this idea? Sure, but please don't let the exceptions take away from what God is saying ought to be the normal pattern. The pattern where we do life together normally and naturally to help each other become more like Jesus. And that will mean, at times, people challenging you and speaking into your life because that's necessary for growth, just like any other category of life. If you want to grow, it will require some stretching. It will require some pushback. We need that if we want to be more like Jesus. So listen, if you want a place where you're challenged to be more like Jesus, this is a great place for you to come on Sundays, to get involved in life group, then that is the place where Jesus will shape you and help you grow to be a person of wisdom. It works if you work it. 
but we're not here to put on the church face and silently smile and nod politely when you just want to blow up your life. We love Jesus and you too much for that. So this week in Life Group, I have some homework for us. And again, I want this to be normal and a natural thing we do. So just chill, everyone. I'm not asking you do something we don't normally already do in Life Groups, okay? But this week, I want us to have the freedom to normally bring up something you're deciding, whether it's about family stuff or budgeting or work or relationships or anything in between, and say, I would like your wisdom on this. What do you all think? And then people can normally give input with an open or closed hand based off of how much biblical data there is on the topic and speak into it. So for example, you share what you're thinking through and people can say something to you like, have you been taking this to Jesus? Where do you sense Jesus is leading you? Why is that? Or people can ask or tell you, can I tell you what's helped me when it comes to this area of life? Or someone can say, hey, I love you. It sounds like you're overthinking this, waiting for the perfect choice to fall in your lap. I don't think that exists, so I think you just need to choose, and I don't think you're wrong either way. Or someone can say, hey, I love you. I want Jesus for you. Can I tell you some concerns I have? I want this to be a place where we can normally bring these things up and challenge each other so that we can further commit our plans to the Lord, so that we can flourish, so that we can pursue the good life that God has for us together. Very last thing I want us to notice in Proverbs 16. I mentioned this earlier, but you notice in Proverbs 16, one through three, with every single line, we see the Lord is behind it all. The Lord, all caps, Yahweh, the covenantal God, the God who draws near to us, the God who is with us, the God who loves us, the God who invites us into relationship. We live in a world created by a God who loves you so much who wants to help you, who wants to guide you so that you're not stumbling around in the dark. And the good news is he gives you his word. He gives you the gift of prayer. He gives you the gift of church family. And what's more, he gives you himself to help you live life wisely. He sent his son made made flesh 2,000 years ago who committed his whole life to God the Father to reconcile us to himself, to pay for our sin and conquer death, to show us where the good life is found in following him and the wisdom that he offers so that you're not stuck on your own, so that you're not simply doing what is pure in your own eyes, but you have God made flesh who you can look to. You have God of spirit who lives inside of you, who gives you grace and love and wisdom beyond measure so that as you make decisions, he is with you every step of the way. Praise be to God for that. So will you pray with me, please?